Tonight, I'm talking about the sting of death. The sting of death. The doctrine of death. And for a text, we turn to 1 Corinthians 15th chapter, uh, verses 56 and 57. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to ask you to say amen, then. Now, you might wonder why I'm talking about death. Well, I came to preach the gospel, that the gospel is good news, but it's bad news first. You wouldn't appreciate good news if you didn't have so much bad news. And this text tonight is a good illustration of what I'm talking about. The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. Oh, that's gloomy. It's sad. It's an ultimatum. But that next verse, but thanks be to God, which gives us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what makes this 57th verse so precious, is because we have that 56th verse. The thing of death, sin. And the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. Our victory is in him. Some years ago, I don't know whether uh, little children are taught to pray this now, but uh, some years ago, nearly every child was taught, now lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. After we begin to make choices for ourselves, we were held to make accountable, we were held accountable to make Jesus our choice. And we had to change our prayer. We now pray, Lord, or we should pray it, help me to wake before I die. And every individual here tonight ought to pray that you will wake up before you die. Now, I'm not going to try to define time because it is, you're not able to define it. Best one can say is that it's a span of consciousness between events. 
It's the span of consciousness between your beginning and your end. You see, everything that had a beginning has a beginning will eventually have an end. In our day, this is called the now generation. And the last few years, uh, people have put in requests for messages that have to do with now. And this is a now message. This is a now message. Because just as surely as there's a now, there's a then. And what you do now, the decision you make now, will determine what it'll be then. All things within us cry out for permanence while everything around us reminds us of mortality and change. Whether you like it or not, whether you want to hear it or not, you are closer to the end now than you were when I started talking. That's one of the things that baffles us. The evidence of time. And while you're trying to describe it, while you're trying to talk about it, the present becomes the past. Now isn't going to always remain now. Fleeting. It's passing. And no one can... Do a thing about it. Now we love to brag about uh, this is an outspoken generation and we are living in outspoken times. When an individual ought to be free to express himself and say what's on his mind. I often hear people say, I'll tell you what I think. Outspoken. But death is probably the only unmentionable subject left in these outspoken times. People will speak their minds on everything but death. And you know, the reason for it is we try to deny death and when we can no longer deny it, we try to defy it. We live in an alienated age, a computerized environment, and a psychedelic society. But you feed whatever data you want to into your computer and you will get no word about death. We 
try to deny it. We try to refuse to face the reality of death. Peter Marshall said that we are trying to create an, an illusion of moral immortality. We just will not come to face to face with the reality of death. We try desperately to keep up a pretense. We start by trying to impress people that we're not getting old. We ought to look our best. We ought to be our best and we ought to do our best for the glory and honor of the Lord. But there's no need of lying about your age. I know so many turned me off then. <laughs> there's no need, there's no need of trying to keep up a pretense. We try to pretend that we are not afraid of death. There are more than five thousand Americans who die in this country every day. And it doesn't always happen to the other family. Every once in a while, it strikes home. Oh, that struck last night, close to home. You know, we try to support this make-believe in funeral service. We don't want to speak of dying. Somehow the word death sticks in our throat. It's much easier, it seems, for us to talk about one has passed or he expired. He fell asleep. He checked in at the gates of eternity. But when it's all said and done, he died. The mortician's work is to make the cost Look as lifelike as possible. And we will call the preacher, and I'm talking out of experience, and tell him what we want him to preach. We don't want you to say anything at all unpleasant. Just talk about him and talk about only the good things about him. We call it a eulogy. But he's asleep. But isn't it strange that when a man just falls asleep, we'll dress him up in a tuxedo and put him in a narrow box. All 
all about training is to try to help us to deny death. And the reason we are trying to deny and defy death is because you have no faith in the life-giving power of God. I want to challenge you tonight to live with confidence and courage and commitment to Christ. Now, all of us know that humanity has two families and two federal heads. The first Adam and the last Adam. We enter the first family by birth. We enter the family of the last Adam by being born again. We confirm our status in the first family by sin and unbelief. We confirm our status in the family of the last Adam by repentance toward God and faith through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now in the first family, death overcomes life. In the last family, Life overcomes death. Those who are born only once must die twice. And those of us who are twice born don't have to die but once. Oh, ever since Adam disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden. This world has been a disaster area. God told Adam, you can eat of all the trees of the garden, but the one in the midst. The day that you eat of that tree, ye shall surely die. Adam knew, and he went on, rather than to place his faith and his confidence in God. And as we look back on it, it seems to us that he should have been satisfied. A beautiful garden, all he wanted to eat, didn't have to work hard, just till this and keep the garden. All he had to do was dress it. Sometimes think the gardeners these days have an easy job. Everything was all right. But he chose to follow Satan, who is an enemy to God. He knows that God has already told him that if you eat of the tree, you shall surely die. Satan tells him, God is trying to mislead you. And Satan is telling men and women that today. That you can go on and do what you want to. You don't have, you're not accountable to anybody. So long as it pleases you, you're free to do it. You're a free moral agent. 
Everything has to rather revolve around you. Satan will tell you that. But remember, we are accountable to God for everything that we do, everything that we say. Or just because he does not call us to accounting on the spot, don't forget it, that there is a reckoning day. Adam disobeyed God, and Satan told him that he would not die. But the moment he disobeyed God, he died. He died spiritually. He knew he was dead. And when one is dead, he wants to put as much distance between him and God as he can. The moment he died spiritually, he tried to hide from God. But I've already said, no matter how far you go from God, you cannot escape. His spiritual death paved the way for his physical death. And you know, the first encounter he had with death, physical death, was the death of his own son. Now, he didn't encounter any other death because he had no ancestors. There were no parents. Nobody in his family was older than he. But one of his sons killed the other son. That's the reason I know that men quit being brothers in Cain and Abel's day. And that's one reason I know that our problem is more than skin deep. Our problem is not a skin problem, it's a sin problem. All we talk about our problem is the difference between races. You know, if we could get that worked out, everything would be fine. No, it's deeper than that. Cain and Abel were the same, or the father, rather the sons of the same father and mother. And they're by the same race. And Cain killed Abel. And that thing is still happening today. I've lived long enough to know that all of the people who are my color are not my friends. And I've learned that all of the people who are of another color are not my enemies. You know, if you're going down a dark stretch of the road at night and you hear some footsteps behind you, you don't stand there and wonder what color that man is. <laughs> you want to know the condition of his heart. And let me stop long enough to tell you that's the only thing that matters. Let me go on here. <laughs> Death forces us to trust the Almighty. When a man has reached the end of his competence, when he can no longer cope, when he's done all that he can do and can't do anymore, he comes face to face with God. 
at death, we come to the end of human knowledge and human power and human comfort. We are left only on the mercies of God. Now, isn't it good sense, or wouldn't it make sense, to trust him now rather than to wait to trust him only when you have to. Oh, I hear some saying that Jesus is a bridge over troubled waters. And he is, but he's more than that. You know, there's in San Diego where I live in the last five or six years, a bridge has been built from San Diego over the bay to Coronado. And our church building is right at the entrance of that bridge. I watched it. I watched that bridge under construction for about three years. I've watched and I've set at that bridge. And it works well now. And I'm glad that I don't have to wait till I come to die. The only thing that I regret is that I didn't accept him before I was 19. I regret all of those years that I let slip by, thinking that I could make the way by myself. Oh, but it pays to serve. It pays every day. Now, death sets the soul at liberty to fly. It's nothing more than stepping from a space-time world out there into the realms of eternal events. Death is a gateway of life and it's the vestibule to heaven. Now, life is important and life is uncertain. But death is real and for many, death is final. There's life before death. And there's life after death. And Christ is the author of life on both sides of death. Praise his name. Now, what you think about life after death depends upon what you think about life before death death. But we have the blessed assurance that life does not end with death. Life does not go out, but it goes on. The Father who has made us will not leave us in the dust but will care for us beyond the bonds of our vision. Death is no dead end street to those who trust Christ. Instead, it's a doorway into the eternal home. We have the knowledge that he, Jesus, has removed the sting of death, the darkness of the tomb, and the mystery from the hereafter. You know, I read quite a bit in this book, and I don't profess to know it all, but as much of it as I've read, I found that Jesus had no respect for funerals. 
He never presided over anybody's funeral. But we do read where he de- presided over resurrection. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. And that alone takes all of the fear out of dying. Every man has a date with destiny, a rendezvous with death, and an appointment with God. You say, preacher, you're not talking to me. I don't, well, that's too morbid. I don't want to hear it. Well, my friends, It's better for you to stop now and find out where you're headed. For whether you want to hear it or not, we are headed through death and out into eternity. And there are not but two places that we can spend eternity. And neither one of them is purgatory. (laughs) It's hell or it's heaven. And praise God, mine is heaven. You have your choice. You have your free moral legion. The Lord has blessed you with a choice. He's given you a good mind and he's waiting on you tonight to make your choice. Well, you don't have to be ignorant about it. You say, well, I don't know enough about it. Well, he has left in his word everything that it takes. To know where you're headed and what's going to happen when you get there. He's left the whole chapter here. This 15th chapter, 1 Corinthians, is called the Resurrection Chapter. Here we have the doctrine of death. And the very first thing that we see about it is that it's a mystery. And a thing that's a mystery, you'll have to have help to understand. And when somebody who knows about it explains it to you, oh, it's so simple, and you wonder why was I afraid of it, and why couldn't I understand it? The Lord will reveal it to you. He has left it on record. Behold, brethren, I show you a mystery. So that's the first thing. And then the next thing is that death is impartial. We shall not all sleep. You know, we are always talking about getting our rights. And this is not across racial lines either. It's within. There are a lot of uh, touchy feelings even in the church. Somebody is likely to think that you're giving a little more time or a little more attention to this member than you are me. You're being partial. Jealousy sets in. Envy sets in. It can happen in any family. It can happen among sisters and brothers. But death is impartial. It's stripped by these of his millions and it robbed Lazarus of his way. Death goes to the philosopher, and he goes to the fool. 
He takes the learned and he takes the unlearned. The death rate is the same all over the world. At least one death per person. <laughs> the next thing about it, it's instantaneous. It's immediate. It doesn't matter how long you linger. There's still just one breath between you and death. It's just a step. So it's instantaneous. No matter how long you live, when it comes, it's just like the moment and a twinkling of an eye. Then the next thing we see is that death can be tragic. I said can be tragic. And if you are fearing death tonight, that means you'll have a tragic death. A tragic death doesn't mean being killed in an airplane crash. But dying without Christ is tragic. It's tragic, I tell you. Now, you might have to die without a doctor, and I might have to die without a nurse. You might have to die without any of your loved ones around. But you don't have to die without Jesus. Without him, death is tragic. But let me rest on to tell you, death can be triumphant. Thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In him, death is triumphant. Oh, death is an enemy, and it's the last enemy that a man has to overcome. And you can't overcome him by yourself. Doesn't matter who you are, but Jesus is the only one who has put death in his place. You know, death stood at the gates of Eden, caught Adam, and he waited for 930 years and put Adam in the grave. Then death waited for sin, 912 years, and put him in the grave. Death followed Mahalio 895 years, and put him in the grave. Death followed Jared 962 years, and put him in a grave. Death was following a man named Enos. But Enos, after walking about 300 years, looked up and saw a city that has foundation, whose building maketh God. He saw a city that lies four square. And I believe he asked the question, what city is this? God no doubt gave him the answer, this is my headquarters. Well, can you tell me a little more about it? Well, this is where the wicked will cease from troubling and the world shall be at rest. But Enoch said, Lord, I'm a long way from where I started out. I believe I'll just walk on with you. He couldn't, death couldn't get to Enoch because he was walking with God. And it doesn't matter how long you live, death followed Methuselah 969 years, 
put him in the grave. Followed Lamech 777 years and put him in the grave. Followed Noah 950 years. Not let you know it doesn't matter how diligently you work, how earnestly you work, how hard you work. He can wait on you until you get the job finished and then sometimes he'll take you right in the middle of your years. All of Noah 950 years put him in the grave. Doesn't matter how faithful you are. All of Abraham, the father of the faithful, 175 years and put him in the grave. And it doesn't matter how good you are. He crowded Job so closely. I say he crowded him. Job knew that he had to go. Said, I wouldn't mind going with you, but I just want to ask a question before I go. If a man dies, Shall he live again? Well, he didn't get his answer then, but the Spirit of God made him cry out. Through all, out all my appointed time, I'll just wait until my change comes. Then death got on Elijah's tree. You know, when Elijah was getting old, God was ready to take him home. They started out for a walk. They walked from Gilgal to Bethel. When they got to Bethel, Elijah thought that the walk was over. When they got to Bethel, the Lord said, let's go to Jericho. When he got to Jericho, he thought that the walk was all over, but he said, no, let's go to Jordan. When he got to Jordan, there Jordan, Jordan was rushing on into the sea. And there he didn't want to trust a crossing over, a wading through. So he just rolled his mantle together. And as he rolled the mantle, no doubt he sang a song on Jordan's stormy bank I stand and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie and he smoked the water and the waters divided and he went over dry shore. when he got on the other side he said Lord I'm getting too old to walk like I used to walk and I never could walk like Enoch walked why don't you lay down your chariot and let me ride. And God dispatched a chariot, a chariot of fire, drawn of horses of fire, with a whole wind doing the driving. Don't you know that disturbed death? He said, we'll allow another one to get away. And he went down to the grave and signed a contract. I'll tell you, I'll not allow another to get away and I'll bring him to him if you will just promise to hold him. Well, Death looked up and he saw one coming out of Eden with dyed garments treading the wine pressed by himself. This one was born in Bethlehem. He was brought up in Nazareth and he was baptized in Jordan. Death followed him as he went about doing good. Death followed him up on Calvary and Death followed him there and stood around the cross. Don't you know death was there? And he was right there. And when he heard Jesus cry out, it's sinning. No doubt he tried to move in. He said, now nah, I've got him. But Jesus, in order to let him know that I didn't say I'm finished, but it is finished. The plan of salvation is finished. And he cried out, Father, into my hands. By hands I commend my spirit. And he 
dropped his head in the lock of his shoulder and died. He died. Nobody killed him. He laid his life down. Well, he died, and death thought surely that he had won the victory. And when he put him in the grave, the grave was happy because he knew that he had another customer and he knew that he was going to hold him fast. What? But they put a rock over the mouth of the rock that was hewn out and they put my rock in that rock and they rolled a rock over the mouth of that rock. And they put a seal around that rock. Well, on schedule, my rock on the inside of the rock, just wheeled in the rock on the outside, rolled away, and my God, my rock rolled with all power in his hand. Yes! And he said, mm, as I live, ye shall live also. <laughs> Believe in him, and death will not make your soul afraid. <laughs> Believe in him, and the grave cannot hold you fast. Believe in him, and you have life everlasting. You have it right now. You don't have to wait until your body can afford your home no longer. I have eternal life right now. Yes, but one of these days I know this old body is going to have to go back to the dust. But when it does, you can just rest assured that I'm changing my location and my place of operation. <laughs> yes, I'm down here. Yes, I am. I'm down here. And every once in a while, I have to ask the Lord to be with me. Oh, have mercy, when I looked out over this vast audience and saw people hungering and thirsting for the gospel, I recognized that I needed the Lord to speak here tonight. And I said, come on, Lord, and be with me. But now when I die, oh, have mercy. And that simply means that I'm going to stop asking him to be with me, but I'm just going home to be with him. Yes, and there we'll be forever and ever. Christ died, but he's not dead. I can't explain that, but it's a fact. He died, but he's not dead. He was buried, but he's not in the grave. I made two trips to the Holy Land last year and just to look in that grave. <laughs> He's not there. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Well, he was raised and he's living now. Yes, he is. He's living right now. His presence is with him. I can feel him. Do you feel him? Do you hear his voice? Then the day you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Lord, <laughs> do you believe in him? Will you trust him? Will you trust him for salvation? Will you trust him for your preservation? Will you trust him to sustain you? Will you trust him while you live? Will you trust him in dying? Lord, <laughs> Well, it's all right. It's all right. It's all right. I'm trying to keep from going on to the fact that he's coming again. I believe that he's coming again. I'm saved. Oh, I have some ups and downs, but I'm saved. It gets dark sometimes, but I'm saved. I get weak on the way, but I'm saved. I get sick sometimes, but I'm saved. How about you?